Think Forward. Think Research Channel. The main things I'm going to cover, sort of questions that I think most people have in regards to cognitive changes with aging are, are what can you expect with age, how much cognitive change is too much, um, and uh, a tougher question in a lot of cases, what can be done to minimize or, or prevent some of these. Um, the 800-pound gorilla I, I was uh, going to start with is Alzheimer's disease, and I think it's, it's sort of impossible not to talk about cognitive changes with aging without at least touching on Alzheimer's disease, which typically is, is uppermost on, on people's minds when they think about cognitive changes with aging. Um, you'll be surprised, perhaps, to, to learn that, that some cognitive uh, functions actually get better with age, and we'll talk about uh, a few of those. There aren't that many, but we'll, we will touch on them. Um, then we'll look at, at things that tend to decline with age, and even with normal aging. Um, and then I'll spend a fair amount of time on what I've called here the, the Reader's Guide to the New York Times Science section, and I'm a bit of an East Coast snob, so you can pick the Chronicle or the Mercury. Everybody has their, their science section and their science reporters, and that ends up being uh, a source of, of information and dissemination of, of the medical literature for a lot of people. And I just want to arm you a little bit with, with some tools for how you might um, read those a little more judiciously and skeptically, because I think that's important. Um, and then last, I promise I'll, I'll, I'll touch on what can be done to alter the course um, uh, in some of these cognitive changes. All right, and I hate to sort of batter people over the head with this, this coming plague sort of approach to Alzheimer's disease epidemiology, but the truth is it is a, a growing problem. It's one that has the potential to sort of sink our already teetering healthcare system uh, further under. So the more, uh, most recent prevalence estimates of Alzheimer's disease in the United States were 4.5 million uh, Americans with Alzheimer's disease in the year 2000. Um, and the same group that, that made this estimate um, about 10 years before the actual numbers came out came up with this estimate of 13 million uh, Americans with Alzheimer's disease by mid-century. So I tend to put a lot of stock in, in this as a conservative and, and pretty reliable estimate. The, the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, as you probably know, is age. Uh, estimated that about one out of 10 people over the age of 65 have Alzheimer's. And by the time you get up into the mid-80s, as many as one out of three uh, people we think likely have Alzheimer's disease. It's an incredibly costly, in, in addition to the obvious and sort of overwhelming uh, individual and social costs, there are great uh, financial costs as well. The other big issue that Merritt's touching on is this newer uh, entity called mild cognitive impairment, or MCI. Uh, this is in many cases a precursor to Alzheimer's disease, though importantly not, not in all cases. And this is a big area of, of research interest um, certainly my own research interest, but also uh, across the country and really across the world. Um, and I'll just give you the definition of mild cognitive impairment. The, f the first criterion is that people have subjective memory complaints. That is, the, the patient themselves, the subject themselves, feels that their memory isn't what it used to be. And then this is probably the most important criterion, is that there are objective deficits. That is, when, when we have a patient come in and undergo formal, pretty exhaustive neuropsychological testing, we can demonstrate uh, that they have focal memory deficits. That is, that their language is normal, their visual spatial skills are normal, their cognitive speed is normal, but they have very focal uh, and obvious deficits in short-term memory in particular. And this 1.5 standard deviations below the mean for age is, is more important for research purposes, but what is important for this setting, I think, is that uh, the neuropsychological testing we do here at Stanford, and, and most places that do this have uh, large sort of normative values. So we know based on your age and your education where you ought to fall uh, in your performance, and that's what we match you up against, and that's very helpful. Uh, for mild cognitive impairment, you can't be demented, which means simply that although you have some cognitive deficits, they aren't severe enough to impair your ability to get by day to day to function independently. Um, if you follow these people longitudinally, so people that you define with these criteria and you follow them out over time, about 12% of these people each year will convert to uh, more florid, sort of clinically obvious Alzheimer's disease. Uh, 
so that over four years, about half of this group will have converted to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and these estimates vary. The 12% per year is sort of a mid-range. Uh, it sort of depends on how strictly you define these criteria. What's also obviously very important, in addition to the fact that this is a high-risk group for converting to Alzheimer's disease, is that a lot of these people, at least over four, five, or six years, don't convert. And it'd be very helpful and important to know when you first see somebody whether they're going to fall into the group that converts or doesn't convert. And this, in particular, trying to predict who's going to convert from MCI to Alzheimer's is a huge uh, research interest area now. And this is another way to, to sort of think about malcognitive impairment as being on the spectrum between normal healthy aging and Alzheimer's disease. Um, and as I mentioned, the sort of the pressing research questions related to mild cognitive impairment are, uh, how do we know who, when we see them at, at time zero, is going to convert and who isn't going to convert? And even more importantly, if we can make that distinction, uh, how can we prevent them from converting? Obviously, that's what we'd love to be able to do. So just a quick uh, Oedipal interlude for the Freudians in the room to sort of remind me about the importance of uh, a metric. These are data generated by my then six-year-old son to sort of remind me about the importance of this. So my wife was away for a weekend and during an otherwise completely pleasant breakfast with my son, he, he un, unsolicited offered up this. He said, Dad, I think, you know, I don't mean to surprise or disappoint you, but I think you should know that I love mommy a little bit more than I love you. <laughs> Just laying it out there. And so progressive Northern California dad that I am, I said, you know, the mother's role in the family can't be underestimated and, or overestimated rather. And I think sensing my panic, he said, well, maybe it would help if I graphed it for you. Again, unsolicited, like... He's really going to drive this point home. So this is the graph that he generated. And the, the main outcome measure here is love, and mom is in blue, and just simple bar graphs, which he'd learned. And you can see she, she out, outdoes me in the love category. Secondary outcome measures, which we'll talk about a little bit, um, which you can't really rely upon, because that's not what, what the, the study was designed to show. Playing, I do actually a lot better. He switched the colors, but <laughs> completely outstripper. Reading, we're sort of neck and neck in, and then promises, interestingly, we were actually dead even in again, and then he remembered something, a promise I'd failed to keep, and got the white out out, if you can see that, and <laughs> sort of knocked me down. But it just brings home the point of, of the importance of having something a little more quantitative um, to, to look at and to gauge somebody's uh, pattern of, of cognitive performance against their peers, um, so that you can really have a sense for whether it's a normal degree of, of cognitive loss or something that we should be more concerned about. Um, and I mentioned already that the neuropsychological evaluation, uh, it, you know, it's certainly not the, the highest tech instrument that we have, but in a lot of ways it's the most reliable and the one that, that we depend on the most. Um, it's a little, as I mentioned, exhaustive and, and tiring, but it, it gives us a great deal of information. And so just a, a couple examples of what goes on at these prolonged neuropsychological evaluations. This is the Ray Auditory Verbal uh, Learning Test, and you have, I think, 16 words here on the left. And what happens is you're given this list of words uh, four times in a row. They're read very slowly, one at a time. And after each uh, reading of the list, you're asked it to automatically tell us how many you remember. And we do that four or five times so that you learn the list very well. Then there's a tricky distraction task or two. And then at five or six minutes and at 20 minutes, we ask you to spontaneously recall this list. And obviously, you know, nobody certainly above 35 tends to get all 16 at, at, at 20 minutes. But we, like, as I mentioned, have normative values for these for age and education. And, and this, more than anything, is what we rely on for deciding that somebody's memory loss, for example, is, is more prominent than, than we'd expect for their age. This is a similar sort of memory task. Here, obviously, visual spatial instead of verbal. You're asked to, to copy this design. And then, again, 10 minutes later, after some distraction, to recall as many features of it as you can um, spontaneously. But it's also important to know that not all dementia is due to Alzheimer's disease. There are a number of other different conditions that we need to think about when we're evaluating uh, patients with a the dementia. There's vascular dementia. There's something called frontotemporal dementia, which is another neurodegenerative disease um, related in some ways to Alzheimer's, but, but different pathology. And ideally, when we have treatments, different treatment uh, modalities. Dementia with Lewy bodies is another neurodegenerative dementia. Um, Alzheimer's disease tends to make up about 70% of, of all dementias that we see, and, and these uh, sort of round out the top four. It's also important to know that there are reversible causes of memory loss. Uh, and when we see somebody in the clinic, uh, things that we always think about because they're easy to fix are vitamin B12 deficiency. Um, and I know, you know everybody and their, their brother takes uh, extra amounts of B12, and, and usually, typically when there's significant B12 deficiency, oral um, B12 doesn't, doesn't fix it. And so this is something that we need to, to treat with uh, intramuscular injections. Thyroid, low thyroid in particular, is something that can be readily fixed um, and can cause memory loss. 
And then there are a number of drugs, and this is probably more important for uh, an older audience where a lot of people are on different antihypertensives. Um, anticholinergics in particular work very well for bladder incontinence. Um, and it's interesting that, that the medicines that we have to treat Alzheimer's disease are actually procholinergic. So they're literally the neurologist and the urologist are sort of butting heads on this issue oftentimes. Um, it's tough. Uh, oftentimes urinary incontinence trumps the, the sort of minimal benefits of, of Aricep. But there are a number of, of medicines that we think about as possibly contributing, uh, often not causing, but maybe exacerbating memory trouble uh, in older patients. Um, I mentioned the anticholinergics. Beta blockers, I, I never want to tread on the primary care uh, physician's feet because these are incredibly potent drugs, particularly for patients with uh, cardiac disease. But sometimes people are on beta blockers when they might be able to get away with something that, that is less likely to affect their, their cognition. Um, Anti-epileptics, most people don't, don't take, uh, it seems these days, for epilepsy, but actually for things like uh, peripheral neuropathy or, or painful feet and diabetes. A lot of those medicines are actually in the anti-epileptic class and they can slow cognition as well. Again, oftentimes there, there's just no alternative to these, so I don't, again, want to tread on my uh, uh, colleagues' feet here. Depression is, is something that we see a fair amount of, actually. I see a lot more depression in my clinic as, as the cause of memory loss than, than B12 or thyroid deficiency. Um, alcohol, I think, is something that, that needs to be talked about a lot and uh, overtly and explicitly. It, it's very clear, at least in my personal experience, that, that somebody who can handle a given amount of, of alcohol uh, in their 30s and 40s can handle about half of that in their 60s and 70s and 80s. And people are very reluctant to admit that. Spouses are very reluctant to bring that up. But it's, it's something that the family recognizes and, and uh, needs to be addressed explicitly, as I mentioned. Um, and retirement I put up here mainly as, as, as a joke. But I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this, that when somebody goes from working 60 or 70 hour weeks to suddenly having essentially nothing that they're accountable for, there's a gigantic drop off in their cognitive exercise in their sense of self-worth oftentimes. Um, and, and you know, it's, I think, more than coincidental that, that oftentimes the first uh, time that somebody comes to, to see me for memory loss is within a year or so of, of stopping uh, work. All right, and because I do mostly imaging research, I, I wanted to show you a few uh, slides of what the brain looks like in older individuals, both in health and, and uh, in, in sickness. So this is uh, a coronal section. So in other words, if we uh, sort of took a slice of the brain this way, we're looking head on at the person uh, about this far back in their brain. And the sort of memory center of the brain, the hippocampus, is located here and here on both sides. This black uh, space here is fluid, cerebral spinal fluid in the middle of the brain, and it also surrounds the brain. So all this black outside the brain is sort of the cushion um, that, that protects the brain when you, when you hit your head, for example. And this is a normal looking, actually sort of super normal looking 70 year old brain with very little brain shrinkage um, and very little in the way of, of small strokes. Uh, this is a 72 year old with mild cognitive impairment. The same slice here now you see the hippocampus on both sides, the memory centers. And you can see there's a little more uh, black or cerebral spinal fluid here and here than on the previous slide. Also the ventricles, the spinal fluid in the middle of the brain uh, have expanded because the brain has shrunk to some degree. Um, and remember, we can't tell just from looking at this person's brain whether they're the MCI patient that's going to convert to Alzheimer's or not. Um, and this sort of examining these hippocampi in, in great detail is one attempted uh, way of, of predicting who will convert. And then this is a 74-year-old patient with clinical Alzheimer's disease. And now I think the, the atrophy in the, in the hippocampal region starts to leap out at you a little bit, uh, as well as the ventricular dilatation. Um, and then you can even see some of these other sulci, as they're called, um, sort of CSF spaces in between parts of, of the brain are much larger. If you look at this one in particular, the brain has shrunk there and, and the CSF is filling in the space compared to, to here. All right, so that's dreary enough. What about what, what gets better with, uh, with normal aging? As I mentioned, there aren't, there aren't lots of things, but there are some things and, and some of them are, are relevant, I think. So uh, these are the three main things that we know get better from, say, ages 30 through 60, 70, and 80. Um, and I'll talk very briefly about each of these. Um, so emotionality, semantic knowledge, and vocabulary. Emotionality, um, Professor uh, Karstensen here at Stanford has done a lot of nice work uh, in the psychology department looking at, at emotionality with aging. And briefly, what this refers to is a tendency to, everybody remembers emotional uh, events better than, than neutral events. But that tendency is, is exaggerated or amplified or improved, I think we should say, uh, in, in older subjects. Um, so a preference for, for positive, emotionally meaningful information over neutral information. Um, 
and this is just from my own personal experience, you know, my parents remember nothing of, of what my kids do badly and, and everything that, uh, that they love about them. Semantic knowledge is sort of the neuropsychologist's term for knowledge about the world, um, and this is something that clearly gets better uh, with age, in large part just from experience. Um, so, you know, the sort of simple tests we use are knowing that a cactus is in the desert, um, but more sophisticated, sort of historically relevant information that, for example, that Ford pardoned Nixon um, are the reasons, at least I think, why I tend to beat my grandfather in double jeopardy, where there's a speed component, but in final jeopardy, where he has all the time in the world, he invariably uh, beats me, because this is knowledge that builds up and accrues over the years and, and tends not to decline. And then vocabulary, everybody knows what vocabulary is, and that is also something that not only doesn't simply plateau, but continues to improve with age. All right, and then cognitive decline with normal aging. Basically, these are uh, six different cognitive domains uh, shown in a cross-sectional study. So if you take 30, 25 year olds, 30, 53 year olds, 30, 74 year olds, and average all their cognitive scores together, you tend to see this sort of a pattern, essentially across all these domains. So inductive reasoning, spatial orientation, verbal memory, uh, numerical ability, all tends to decline with normal aging. Again, and getting back to the importance of, of comparing uh, you at age 74 with other 74 year olds and not with yourself you know, at age 44. Um, and this is the same data actually done uh, with longitudinal sampling now. So uh, testing somebody, say, at age 53, and then testing the same group of subjects again seven years later. So a bit more um, credible data, but that shows essentially the same thing. There's also normal changes in the brain with aging. I showed you a very healthy looking 70 year old brain. If you looked at that same person 40 years earlier, at say age 30, you'd tend to see larger uh, regions in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, certainly the hippocampus, that memory center I showed you, has normal atrophy or decline with age. Um, some regions, like the occipital cortex, which is important for vision, tend not to, to shrink much at all with age, and we're not sure why this is the case. You also notice with the hippocampus that while this declines sort of linearly, there's a bit of a, a nonlinear, quicker drop-off here in the older age, and it probably has something to do with MCI and maybe uh, preclinical Alzheimer's disease. And we touched on this briefly, uh, but this also points to another problem that we see in, in aging brain. So this is a 47-year-old brain. Now these are uh, cross-sections. So you can see the eyeballs here at the top with the nose in the middle. And this is one higher than that, and this is towards the top, all is cross-sections like that. Um, and here's the, the memory area in this view. So this is a, a less healthy 67-year-old brain um, who now you start to see, again, the atrophy of the hippocampus. These black regions are getting bigger. And what's more important here are these white lesions, which are called uh, small vessel ischemic disease, or sometimes sort of mis miscalled uh, mini strokes. We're not exactly sure why this starts to accumulate. We're pretty sure it's not good for you, and we know it has something to do with um, vascular risk factors. But this is proven surprisingly sort of elusive as to what this accrual of this sort of white matter disease is due to, what it entails, um, how much uh, of a burden it puts on cognition, and, and how to treat it. So this is another active area of, of research. All right, and I want to spend a fair amount of time on this uh, sort of reader's guide approach. So it, it's tough, you know, having a uh, family come into the clinic and somebody will literally drop, you know, the, the Tuesday Science Times on my desk and say, have you seen that aluminum causes Alzheimer's disease or that cell phones cause brain tumors? And it happens a lot, um, and particularly in Alzheimer's disease because it's an illness that everybody would love to, to be able to treat or prevent. Um, but there's some important things to know about Alzheimer's disease studies uh, in particular. Alzheimer's disease is a very gradual illness and it costs a lot of money and requires a lot of uh, patients to do good uh, forward-looking or prospective studies. So a lot of what we get initially is actually not putting somebody on uh, a, a ibuprofen and seeing if they don't develop Alzheimer's disease over the next 15 years because those are very expensive studies. What happens instead is you take a thousand people who already have Alzheimer's disease and a thousand age-matched uh, older controls who don't have any cognitive trouble and you literally sort of go through their medicine cabinet and say, you know, the people who didn't have Alzheimer's disease tended to take cholesterol-lowering agents more than the Alzheimer's patients did. And the problem is um, that there are a lot of statistical issues with that that, that make it a, a good way to generate hypotheses but, but not to prove anything. And all these retrospective studies where you go back and see what, what people were doing, how they were living, what medicines they were taking, how much alcohol they used, need to be proven or borne out in prospective studies. And that's a much more burdensome, painful undertaking and one that doesn't get any press because it's, it's a lot less uh, uh, stimulating and, and it takes much longer to do.
Um, but without going into the details here, as I mentioned, there are a number of statistical issues with retrospective or case control studies. So you need to be very careful when you read this big headline about cholesterol-lowering agents or uh, ibuprofen or uh, anti-ulcer medicines 10 years ago, which has since been debunked. But there's one every year or two, basically, that comes out. Um, and you know, one, one big issue is that uh, a patient who 10 years ago was taking an anti-cholesterol-lowering agent, there are a lot of things about that patient or that healthy control that are different uh, than an Alzheimer's patient who 10 years earlier wasn't taking that. They may have had a higher education, better access to, to health care, uh, any number of things that could be a confound. Um, and they try and control for these, these sorts of confounds, but it's, it's hard to, to do that completely and, and uh, without fail. So this, these prospective studies are the gold standard in, in clinical medicine. They're very hard to do, they're very costly, they're very time consuming. Um, and in particular, um, this randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study where you say, for example, there's been a retrospective study that shows or suggests that there's an association between, say, ibuprofen and not getting Alzheimer's disease. And so the next step is to test that prospectively and take 100 patients, say, with MCI and 100 healthy, con or, yeah, 100 patients with MCI and put half of them on ibuprofen and half of them on a placebo, follow them for three or four years, and see whether you know, your hypothesis that was generated in the backwards-looking study actually is borne out. Um, and you mentioned here that these are where case control studies go to die because a lot of this, unfortunately, doesn't uh, pan out in prospective studies. And speaking of NSAIDs, this is one recent and pretty telling example of, of you know, it, it's not that we, we ought not to do these, we have to do these studies, but we also have to be prepared that a lot of them are going to be negative and aren't going to pan out. Um, and this was a, a very nicely, uh, uh, organized and carried out randomized placebo-controlled study of uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agent that had no effect um, in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And these are just some of the cardinal rules when, when thinking about these articles. So we already talked about the fact that, that a correlation or an association between having taken an NSAID 10 years earlier and not having Alzheimer's disease doesn't prove causality, right? That's the biggest sort of fallacy about these backwards-looking studies is that it, all it shows is an association and you can't make any more of it than that until you've done the gold standard studies. There's also a pretty significant bias still against negative studies, so it may be the case that 10 studies were done looking at uh, you know, statin use, anti-cholesterol agents in retrospective studies. Six of them might have been negative, but because it's hard to get negative studies published, they never make it to the light of day and the four positive studies get published. Um, and then the other important thing in thinking about these trials that get reported is that something that's statistically significant over 500 patients may have very little clinical significance in a, in a single subject. Um, and again, you, you don't have to worry too much about all these, but mostly as sort of a, a warning to take these with a grain of salt. Um, and so with that in mind, I promised I'd close um, thinking about things that we might be able to do to minimize really both the sort of normal decline with aging, but I think more importantly, um, the sort of drop off from normal healthy aging uh, and some mild cognitive decline into MCI or Alzheimer's disease. Um, and this is just sort of a list of things that have come up in these retrospective studies over the last five or 10 years that I've been asked about, um, and I'm happy to field more. I obviously won't cover every one that's, that's come out there. Um, and I, I don't want to come out as, as sort of nihilistic about these things. A lot of these have given us very good leads that are being followed up now, but a lot have, have sort of fallen off the radar for, for good reason. Um, so there are a bunch of sort of interpretations you could come up with uh, based on these sorts of studies that healthy living is the best way to, to stave off cognitive decline or sort of the opposite, the weekend in Reno, alcohol, cigarettes even have been in, shown in some studies to have cognitive benefits, coffee. Um, drugs, uh, again, statins, uh, NSAIDs, things like that. I'll, show, I'll point to a couple other studies. There's a big interest now in this notion of cognitive reserve and sort of a corollary of that cognitive training. Um, which I'll touch on briefly. I never ever make people do crossword puzzles if they don't enjoy them. I think this, this gets overinterpreted as to uh, something that's gonna be saving brain cells. I think it's a, a fate worse than death to have to do crossword puzzles if you don't like them. Um, all right, so a lot of these are either retrospective studies or they're prospective, meaning you, you figure out how much coffee somebody's drinking and then you follow them out over two or three years. And that's, that's a, a prospective observational study is one cut above a retrospective study because at least you're getting a good sense for what the people are actually imbibing or taking. Um, so there are a couple older studies suggesting that, that uh, sort of frequent long-standing coffee users do better and, and tend to show fewer or less cognitive decline over time. And this tends not to be the case when these studies are done 
carefully. And what you tend to see instead is perhaps a little bit of preservation of, of sort of motor speed and translating a thought into an action because you're sort of ramped up on caffeine. But nothing, you know, in terms of memory or visual spatial skills or, or language, the things that we, we sort of put more weight in, um, in trying to preserve. So there have been a lot of studies uh, on alcohol. I gave you my take on alcohol earlier. Um, you know, the other issue with these retrospective studies is that there needs to be some biological plausibility to the, the association. In other words, there must be something good about, or potentially good about alcohol that's preventing people from getting uh, Alzheimer's disease or protecting them. Um, and again, obviously the bulk of these have either been retrospective or in this case prospective but only observational. There are no studies that I know of where you randomize 100 patients with Alzheimer's disease to you know, two glasses of Zinfandel or two glasses of, of placebo. And that's what you would have to do to, to prove any of this. Um, I think what a lot of these end up reflecting actually, uh, again getting back to this confound, you know, it's always people who drink moderately. It's one to two glasses of wine. People who don't drink at all tend not to show these effects, and people obviously who drink excessively uh, tend not to be protected. And, and just once again, there are a lot of things about sort of moderate drinking that are probably reflected in, in other things that those people do, living moderately, living healthily, living carefully, being able to control their appetites, you know, um, they probably weigh less. And again, all these things are attempted, they, they attempt to control for these, but it's very hard to control for all the confounding features that moderate alcohol intake might actually be reflecting. Um, that said, there are some, some biologically plausible reasons why alcohol might be uh, neuroprotective. Um, you know, if you read French studies, it's wine only. If you read American studies, it's wine or beer. Um, but it's been suggested, or it's been shown that there's an association, again, no causal link, an association between moderate alcohol use and not developing or having a lesser risk of developing uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Um, later. Cigarettes, I think, you know, five years ago people were still sort of thinking because this uh, nicotine is something of a stimulant that there might actually be some truth in, in the earlier studies that suggested that cigarettes can help preserve cognition. This is, has been pretty thoroughly debunked, needless to say. Um, this is a big one that gets asked a lot and uh, this is one of the few sort of non-prescription uh, or even over-the-counter um, regulated medicines that's been looked at. So people obviously take a lot of different uh, herbal remedies, home remedies, and very few of them have been looked at uh, in a scientific fashion. Ginkgo's the rare exception, and there actually have been at least two, and I think probably more like four or five, randomized, placebo-controlled uh, studies of ginkgo, both of which, or at least the two that I've looked at and that I have the most stock in, are at, were negative, didn't show any benefit of ginkgo. Um, one of these, uh, this one here, which was published in one of the more prominent medical journals, uh, was done in, in healthy, older subjects, I think in their 50s. Uh, or no, just older than 60 years. So these people didn't have any memory loss, but they wanted to stave off memory loss and they were willing to try ginkgo. Um, and if you looked at, at people who got ginkgo and people who got placebo, um, there was no difference after, at the end of the study in cognitive performance. And then the bigger question typically with ginkgo is, is does it help in Alzheimer's disease? Not in healthy 60 year olds, but in 65 or 70 year olds who have Alzheimer's disease. Um, and this is another randomized uh, placebo controlled trial, the gold standard that we look to looking at ginkgo and Alzheimer's disease and showing no effect in a nicely, nicely done study. Um, this gets a little bit to this negative um, uh, finding bias. So typically a big study like this by, by uh, a good group, a good Alzheimer's research group would get published in a high profile journal, but because this is essentially a negative study, it came out in a, in a much less well-known journal um, and probably didn't get much lay press either because of that. So that's the negative bias uh, that I mentioned before. Vitamin E is another one that I get a lot of questions about. There was a study in uh, 2000 now, I guess, a big study, it was in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, suggesting that vitamin E was, in high doses, 2,000 units per day, was protective in Alzheimer's disease, and people who took vitamin E at that dose did better than, than people who took placebo in Alzheimer's disease. That study um, got lots of press. It was uh, pretty statistically iffy, actually. It had to be, initially there were no significant differences between placebo and vitamin E, but then they corrected for the fact that, that I think the placebo group had a, a higher cognitive score at baseline, which is a bit of a, a statistical no-no, but, but basically it was, a, it was an iffy finding to begin with. In the interim, there's been uh, a recent meta-analysis suggesting that at, at high doses, such as 2,000 units used in, in Alzheimer's disease previously, there may actually be some risk um, to vitamin E. Uh, and then I think even more importantly, there's been a, a recent, again, New England Journal of Medicine study. This is probably the best study we have in mild cognitive impairment to date, and I'll show you uh, the, one of the last slides talks about that study. But basically, 
If you randomized people with mild cognitive impairment to vitamin E or placebo and looked at conversion to Alzheimer's disease, three years later there was no difference between vitamin E and placebo. So for this sort of laundry list of reasons, I, I've now stopped recommending vitamin E for patients with uh, memory loss or Alzheimer's disease. Cardiologists obviously have, have different recommendations, and, and this doesn't mean you should toss your vitamin E out, but um, if it's from your neurologist, maybe you do want to toss it out. So statins, uh, I think I'll show this one and then maybe one last slide. Statins are used ubiquitously and, and uh, beneficially by a lot of primary care physicians and geriatricians to lower people's cholesterol. There were a series of, again, retrospective studies suggesting that there was an association between having taken statins and having a lesser risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, and now, sort of the due diligence step after the retrospective study is to do a prospective randomized clinical trial and to look at this. Um, this is the one positive prospective study that I know of. It was very, very small. Um, it needs to be replicated, and nobody has really left on this yet in, in the field. But it's promising, and again, this is the sort of step that you have to go through to prove that one of these retrospective studies is actually going to bear some fruit in, in a real-world setting. So the jury's still out on statins. Certainly, if you have high cholesterol, you should take them, but I wouldn't start taking them now to, to stave off memory loss because these aren't completely uh, benign medicines. All right, and this is the prevention trial uh, in mild cognitive impairment that I mentioned. This is a very large study, uh, multi-site, uh, randomized, placebo-controlled study of patients with mild cognitive impairment meaning memory loss but not yet demented, who have a big conversion rate to Alzheimer's disease. So it's a, it's a good group to study. And here, patients were randomized either to placebo or to vitamin E or to denepazil, which is sort of the mainstay of, of treatment in Alzheimer's disease. It's better known as Aricept. And the main outcome measure here uh, was conversion from MCI to Alzheimer's disease at three years. So that was the, the one that the, the study uh, coordinators were banking on. That's what they really wanted to look at. And neither vitamin E nor Aricept had any uh, impact on conversion compared to placebo. So at three years, the same number of subjects converted in the, in the three different groups, which was disappointing. There are lots of sort of uh, subgroup analyses. And if you looked at just one year, instead of at the three-year primary outcome measure, at one year, fewer patients who had received denepazil converted to Alzheimer's disease over that first year. But again, at three years, they'd caught up. So it's hard to get too excited about these data. And those secondary outcome measures are, again, sort of statistical no-nos. They're supposed to generate ideas for, for subsequent studies, but that's not uh, what the investigators were trying to show. I don't have a lot of time to talk about cognitive reserve. There is some data to suggest that the better educated you are, uh, sort of the, the more smarts you have, the more you can tolerate uh, sort of preclinical Alzheimer's disease pathology. And the best example of this are a couple very uh, sort of outstanding epidemiological studies involving religious orders, um, one around Kentucky and one near Chicago, which are sort of known in the lay press as the Nun study and, and this one, the other Nun study, um, which also had actually some, some brothers in it. Um, but here they showed that, that basically if you looked at, at patients who came to autopsy, so these communities are very tight, tightly knit. People have been there for a long time. They're exposed to the same food, uh, the same sort of social milieu. It's a very attractive way to, to conduct a study. Um, and basically, the, the, the more education you had, the less impaired you were with the same degree of Alzheimer's disease pathology. So somebody who has, you know, an Alzheimer's disease pathology score of 10 and who has a PhD is less clinically impaired than somebody who has the same amount of Alzheimer's pathology but only had a high school education, for example. Um, and it's, it's very unclear what, what's driving this, but it's been uh, shown in a couple different instances now. And this is this notion of cognitive reserve. The brain's plastic, and there's some hope that by actually engaging in, in very rigorous and focal cognitive training, you can bump up your cognitive reserve. Um, this is a nice study in, in healthy young people who um, were taught to juggle. These were non-jugglers uh, initially. And at three months, these regions of the brain, which are important for uh, visual spatial skills, had actually grown. The, the gray matter had grown over just three months of this very focal uh, training. And then at three months later, when they stopped juggling and sort of their skills tapered off, the, the brain region um, shrunk back. Just to point out that the brain is very plastic, and it's not just 20 and 30-year-olds, but 60-year-olds, 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds. People's uh, brains continue to make new neurons, which is a, a recent discovery. Um, and they're very plastic and very amenable to, to training still. The problem with training is that you can't really train um, people in the, the sort of spectrum of, of cognitive domains that you'd like to. So this is a very nice randomized controlled trial, actually randomizing people to different uh, cognitive training protocols. And what was 
exciting is that people, if you train them in a short-term memory uh, task, they did better on that task three months later after weeks of training. Maybe not that surprising. What was disappointing is that the people who got trained on the memory task didn't get better on any other, uh, in any other cognitive domain. So it was a very focal improvement. People who got visual spatial training did better in visual spatial skills, but not in, in memory skills. So this is, would be a very uh, laborious and cost ineffective approach to, to improving your cognitive skills. So these are my, my recommendations. They're not very sophisticated, but I, I'll, you know, again, I, I don't want to be nihilistic about it, but I want to be realistic and I want you to, to be healthy and not take uh, you know, cholesterol lowering medicines if you don't need them. Um, so you know, the, the alcohol studies to me, more than anything else, just mean that people who do things moderately, including alcohol, tend to do better. I, again, I don't prescribe um, you know, Merlot or Zinfandel. Um, and if anything, I actually try and encourage people to reduce their alcohol intake um, to you know, maybe half of what they were drinking 10 or 15 years earlier. Um, this is just general you know, good uh, recommendation. It, it's probably the case that people with more cardiovascular disease uh, do worse when they develop Alzheimer's disease because in addition to the Alzheimer's disease, there's probably a vascular component to their dementia. Um, so, you know, watching your cholesterol, your blood pressure, your weight are all important things for your general health, but probably also for your brain health. Um, this is just sort of the cognitive reserve uh, hypothesis at work um, and, and sort of ties in with um, staying active. There are a bunch of leisure study um, uh, studies that have been published recently showing that, you know, the more active people are even in, in sort of uh, assisted living facilities, the more they play cards and, and socialize, the better they do. Um, with, with their cognitive skills later. Um, and this, you know, the, the problem, as I mentioned, with, with cognitive training and these cognitive interventions and giving somebody, a, you know, four hours uh, of computer training a day to, to try and ramp up their memories, that, that's all that you end up ramping up. Um, and really what's much more effective in the way our brain is exercised and um, thrives and stays plastic and, and can remain healthy is, is by social interaction um, and just sort of day-to-day engagement with other humans. So I think that's, that's sort of a generic but very important skill and the people that I worry the most about are the people who for whatever reason you know are spending four or five hours on the couch watching TV, falling asleep. Those people are much more likely to decline faster. I think that's clear. Um, and then lastly, you know, we're, we're close uh, I think in Alzheimer's disease, a lot closer than we've, we've been before but there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and this is, tends to be a very research um, uh, active audience and community, and we're very appreciative of that. So I just encourage you to continue to participate uh, in research and or support it um, if you're able to do that. And I want to take uh, questions, so thanks. I haven't seen anything that specific, sort of vegan versus uh, omnivorous. You know, again, there are bound to be changes. People, I don't want to generalize, but people who tend to have six steaks a week also tend to have, you know, 15 beers, and people who are vegan tend to be a lot more careful about their health. So you'd need to be very careful about those confounds. Um, but yet there are huge differences in, in how people eat and, and in diets that probably do have some impact. But I'm not very familiar with, with those studies if they've been done. The way people typically arrive at this neuropsychological testing is to say to their primary care physician, for example, my memory isn't what it used to be. It's a little worse than, than you know, what I see in my friends of my age, and I'm concerned about it. The primary care doctor then can either refer directly to neuropsychology or, or have them stop by and see me first. I do a neurologic exam and take a history and then refer them to neuropsychology. Uh, and that's, that's the sort of the safest, most conservative way to do it. Um, you know, I'm sure there are things online that you could, you could take and look at, but I, I can't vouch for any of those. The question was, in somebody who's had atrophy or shrinkage of their left temporal lobe, uh, part of their brain from a stroke or an infarct, who's had some behavioral changes, what, what can their friends expect in the future? And I was just making the point that infarcts or strokes tend to have a precipitous decline, um, a, a pretty significant deficit, and then some people stay that bad and don't get better, but most people show some improvement uh, in their function. Uh, but what doesn't happen with stroke typically is progressive decline beyond the initial insult. So um, I guess they could expect you to be as obsessive and, you know, as, as you are now, but not, not get any more prominently so. So that's a great question. You know, the, 
the, the reason we, we put people through these four-hour neuropsychological evaluations is not because we're um, sadistic, it's because we don't have any tests for, for Alzheimer's disease. MRIs are done only to exclude other diseases, so to make sure somebody hasn't had a number of strokes or doesn't have a brain tumor. You can eyeball, literally, I mean, this is the, the state of the art right now, you can sort of look at, at somebody's MRI in the clinic and say, oh, there's more atrophy of the, the hippocampus than I'd like to see. But that, that is in no way scientific, and we just can't say anything other than their memory loss isn't due to a stroke or a big tumor. And that's, that's the best we can do with MRIs right now. The question is how the role of uh, omega-3 fatty acids in, in brain function. And unfortunately, I don't think that has a, a definitive answer. It's another one of these um, dietary trends or tendencies that have shown an association um, in some studies, but not any causal effect. So it's, it's another sort of retrospective finding. Um, you know, and, and I can't speculate what the, the exact role of omega-3 fatty acids might be in, in sort of brain health or brain maintenance. Depression, we think, has a very real uh, effect on cognition and sort of an organic, you know, brain effect in that if you uh, image people, if you do functional imaging of people with depression, they tend to show deficits, uh, functional imaging deficits in their frontal cortex, which is important for attention, alertness, uh, and memory, among other things. When you treat those people, whether it's with talk therapy or psychotherapy or medication, those deficits tend to uh, resolve their cognitive performance improves and the, the functional MRI or, or PET study gets better. Um, and there have been some suggestions that um, treatment with antidepressants in animal models can, can, uh, can cause sprouting of, of new neurons or uh, neurogenesis, as it's called. But that hasn't been, been shown definitively in humans at all. It's hard to know sometimes. I mean, sometimes people just know, right, that everybody forgets a word here and there, but, you know, things that, that really concern us are repeating the same question two or three or four times over the course of a day, telling the same story, <clears throat> again, two or three or four times over the course of the day. Everybody will do that here and there, right? But if you're doing that more than, than your friends are doing it or more than your spouse is doing it or your, um, your significant other, that, that's when we tend to get worried. But it, it has to be subjective at the first, you know, on the front end. We, we can't... That's it. Forgetting things more than you did five years ago and more than your friends are. You know, you have to sort of get a sense for what, what people in your, of your ilk are, are doing similarly or to a lesser degree. That's when it's concerning, I think.